prostitutes, escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. Tonight, the former president federally indicted. Today, an indictment was unsealed, charging Donald J. Trump with conspiring to defraud the United States, conspiring to disenfranchise voters, and conspiring and attempting to obstruct an official proceeding. The special counsel charges the former president for his role in attempting to overturn the 2020 election and the insurrection that followed. We have team coverage in Washington, D.C. and New York covering it all. Plus, he said from the moment I met him that I did not do this. So we're prepared to go forward. We will defend this case in a court of law and we will go to trial in this case. The suspected serial killer behind the Gilgo murders in court. What we're learning about the man at the center of the case and the large amount of data recovered by prosecutors and it is a make or break moment for Team USA on the world stage after a disappointing match. Do they have what it takes to keep their World Cup dreams alive? We're in New Zealand to find out. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin with yet another striking moment in American history. Former President Trump has been indicted yet again, this time in a push to overturn the 2020 election. He now faces three criminal indictments at the same moment that he's also the clear frontrunner in the Republican race to win back the White House in 2024. Special Counsel Jack Smith addressed the country late today, encouraging Americans to read the 45-page four-count criminal indictment, which begins by saying the former president the president lost the 2020 election, knew he lost it, and then for months spread lies that there had been outcome determinative fraud in the election and that he had actually won. Smith stressed, though, the defendant must be presumed innocent until proven guilty. The sprawling indictment accuses Trump of three conspiracies, one to defraud the U.S., a second to obstruct an official government proceeding, and a third to deprive people of civil rights provided by federal law or the Constitution. The fourth count is obstruction of and attempt to obstruct an official proceeding. Attorney General Merrick Garland late today called the investigation the largest in the Justice Department's history and said Special Counsel Smith and his investigators followed the facts wherever they may lead. And we're told today prior to the news of the indictment, the former president was golfing at his home in Bedminster. But how is he reacting tonight? Our John Santucci just spoke to him on the phone. He'll join us shortly. Our team is standing by tonight to break down this entire indictment for us and what comes next. We begin with our Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight, Donald Trump, former president of the United States, indicted for allegedly trying to subvert democracy and overturn the will of American voters in the 2020 election because he was determined to remain in power. Today, an indictment was unsealed, charging Donald J. Trump with conspiring to defraud the United States, conspiring to disenfranchise voters, and conspiring and attempting to obstruct an official proceeding. Trump informed of the sweeping indictment just before it was unsealed. The charges outlined in the sweeping indictment. Prosecutors say Trump spread lies that there had been outcome determinative fraud in the election and that he had actually won. These claims were false and the defendant knew they were false. Still, they say Trump worked to create an intense national atmosphere of mistrust and anger and erode public faith in the administration of the election. The indictment going methodically, state by state, accusing Trump and his unnamed co-conspirators of creating fraudulent slates of electors in seven states, of trying to compel the Justice Department to sham election crime investigations, of pressuring Vice President Mike Pence to reject legitimate electoral votes on January 6th, and ultimately sending his supporters to the Capitol to obstruct the certification proceeding and exert pressure on the Vice President. We're going to walk down to the Capitol and we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. 
Smith's indictment documenting dozens of Trump's alleged lies and the pressure he put on Republican state officials. In a phone call, Trump pushing Georgia's Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger to find the votes he needed. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. Prosecutors allege Trump's criminal scheme culminated on January 6th with what they call the president's exploitation of the violence and chaos at the Capitol. Our Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, just big picture this for us. How serious are these charges being brought by the special counsel? This is perhaps the biggest case in the history of the Justice Department. They've essentially indicted a former sitting president, accusing him of being criminal in office, that he essentially knew he lost the election, that there was no wide-scale fraud, and that he then attempted to steal the election for himself. So you feel a lot more gravity here than the two prior indictments? Well, those were quite serious in terms of taking classified documents away from the White House, making them vulnerable, uh, this obstruction case that they're building in terms of a cover-up. But this gets at the heart of American democracy. What does a president do if they lose? Mm. And the Justice Department is saying he knew he lost and then attempted to steal the election. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you as always. Pleasure. And let's go to ABC senior reporter Catherine Falders, who's at the courthouse today. Catherine, when can we expect to see the former president in court to face these charges? Now, the former president has been summoned to appear at this courthouse Thursday, this coming Thursday, at 4 p.m. Eastern. He will be right here behind me. It's possible that he could remain completely out of view. This is a federal courthouse, so there are no cameras allowed. There's garages where he can go underground and get into many of these courtrooms without being seen at all. But we are expecting him to be here 4 p.m. on Thursday, Eastern time, this Thursday. He will be appearing, we're told, at least expected to appear, with two of his attorneys, Todd Blanche and John Loro, who has just been brought on to lead the January 6th investigation for the Trump legal team. So Thursday at 4 p.m., the question is, will he be processed? How will that work? All of this is still being sorted out among uh, conversations between Trump's legal team and, of course, Jack Smith's team. He was processed, fingerprinted, I should say. The last indictment in Florida in the Mar-a-Lago case, we're expecting that same system to play out at this courthouse behind me. So, Catherine, I know that you're saying that we may not see, it's very possible that we may not see the president at all, the former president, uh, what kind of scene might we expect to see? Right. It's possible that we might not see him on camera, for example, given that there are no cameras in the courtroom. Of course, we can observe and, and be in the courtroom and see him in there. There, I'm sure, will be sketches released. Um, but we expect a similar scene to what we saw in Miami, given that this is federal court. So he can pull in here, enter the courthouse through a garage. It's expected that that's what he will do. There's ability to process in this courthouse, in the basement of the courthouse. So if he is to get fingerprinted, that's likely where it will take place. After that, surely he will go up to the courtroom where he is set to appear. It's unclear if we'll see him in any hallways. There will be lots of security around this courthouse the day he appears. They've typically, uh, at least courthouses, been canceling all court activity for the day. So we expect that to happen here, too. Catherine Folders for us. Thanks so much, Catherine. And John Santucci, kind enough to join us. Now, John, I kind of want to go in reverse, because I know that you did speak with the former president yeah. today on the phone. But I want to get a sense, because obviously he received this target letter about two weeks ago. Yeah. And so what was his initial reaction as far as people in his orbit? What were they telling you about his demeanor then? Well, his demeanor then, so I'll, I'll take that trip with you, Lindsay. We'll go back two weeks ago. His demeanor then was shock. He could not believe that this was the case, because attorneys and advisors had been telling him out of everything that was going on. And what I mean by that, Lindsay, as we've reported, you and I have had this conversation several times, there are four active investigations involving Trump and his allies. The Manhattan DA's probe, which we've already seen has happened. The documents case, which we have seen, plus a superseding indictment. This one being January 6th, another one from the special counsel. And then we are still waiting on a fourth case. That is the Fulton County, Georgia's investigation into Trump and his allies' efforts to overturn the election in that state. Now, out of all four of those, Lindsay, Team Trump's advisors were telling the former president that in regards to January 6th, that's the one you're probably not going to be included in. Don't worry about that one. So when that target letter was sent to Trump's lawyers late on a Sunday evening two weeks ago, 
stupefied was what one person said to me, Lindsay. They could not believe this was the case. Trump at that point in time reacting in pure rage, their team trying to figure out who is going to be involved here. Because again, Lindsay, as we've been reporting for the last several weeks, there has been a constant effort by Donald Trump and his lawyers to staff up, to build out legal teams on each of these probes. And the January 6th team, out of all of the probes, Lindsay, pretty much had nobody on it. All right, so then let's fast forward. He's had a bit of time to let this all sink in, mm -hmm. if you will, that this third indictment was, in fact, going to happen. Yeah. You talked to him on the phone today. What's his response? Uh, Lindsay, he told me in real time that this was pile on by special counsel Jack Smith. Uh, and pile on, Lindsay, reacting to all of the investigations uh, around him right now. And I said to him, well, but how do you square that with all of these probes? And he called all of them, Lindsay, the total four, ridiculous. He then said the charges are yet again in his mind, Lindsay, election interference, and he believed that he's going to fight this, and he maintained, Lindsay, that, quote, we will win, referring to the election 2024, where he is an active candidate, and also all of these probes. And I have to tell you, Lindsay, you, you, you know this, I've covered Donald Trump for nearly a decade for ABC News, and it was probably one of the calmer conversations I've ever had with him. Lindsay? Oh, very interesting there, and great to have that insight. John Santucci, our thanks to you as always. Thank you, Lindsay. Let's bring in our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. John, we've gotten a chance to go through this 45-page indictment. What, what strikes you? What stands out? The weight of it, the seriousness of it. We, we know Donald Trump is facing legal challenges everywhere. There's the New York Attorney General's, the, 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 the district attorney's case. There's the civil case from the New York Attorney General. Uh, there's the Georgia case, which we expect. There's the documents case. This, I think, is qualitatively different than all of them and weightier. He is being charged here with deprivation of rights. That's one of the counts. What does that mean? It means depriving American citizens of what right? Their right to have their vote count. Uh, you see chapter and verse how he tried to overturn an election that he knew he had lost. And not by challenging it in court the way losing candidates often do and have a right to do, but by uh, going through a series of actions that Jack Smith alleges are plainly illegal. And we also heard from John Santucci, who got a chance to speak yeah. to the former president today. And, you know, he was saying that this is a pylon, calling it ridiculous. Is it that easy just to kind of blow this off? I mean, absolutely not. You know, I, first of all, this, if you, I want to take you back to a moment, a really important moment. It was February 13th of 2021. Donald Trump had just been acquitted by the uh, U.S. Senate in the impeachment trial. Uh, now, seven Republicans had voted to found him guilty, which was, you know, a high watermark in all of American history uh, for a, a party, a president's party. Uh, but right after it, Mitch McConnell rose to speak. He had voted uh, not guilty, but he wanted to make it clear he didn't mean not guilty in a literal sense. And he said we, it was his view that he shouldn't be impeached because he was already out of office. Uh, but that the legal system, the criminal justice system, can and will hold him to account. That's finally happening two and a half years later. All right. Many people didn't think that this day would come, yeah. and we'll see what ultimately comes out of it. But, John, we thank you so much for your coverage. Thank you. And we are joined now by former GOP Congressman John Cadco, now an ABC News contributor. Thanks so much for joining us. I, I just want to kind of start by, by digging in a little bit. Shortly after the preamble here in this indictment, uh, it says that Donald J. Trump did knowingly combine, conspire, confederate, and agree with co-conspirators conspirators known and unknown to the grand jury to defraud the United States by using dishonesty, fraud, and deceit to impair, obstruct, and defeat the lawful federal government function. It goes on and on, but really lays out, and as we've heard from John, this goes state by state. It, it talks about the different conversations that he had. It really is quite uh, impressive when you look at all of the, the detail and the lengths that the investigators went through over this past uh, year plus. Do you think that this will sway or have any impact on, on Trump supporters? Well, I think it will because the level of detail in, in this indictment is quite extraordinary. And to me, that is uh, um, something that really stands out. But in the end, also, this indictment is like many I did when I was a, I, a federal organized crime prosecutor for 20 years before going to Congress. Uh, a conspiracy charge is very simple. You, you have to prove that two or more persons can, agreed to violate a federal law and that the charged defendant was part of it. That's it. Everything else in here is meant, this, all the facts are set out to just prove 
uh, that, that, that is true. They don't have to prove all the facts, just had to prove enough to show that the president uh, agreed and became part of this conspiracy. And there's plenty of evidence in there that points in that direction. So to me, this, this indictment is actually quite simple and quite detailed. And the, the thing about it is, the first thing the jury's gonna hear before even opening statements is a judge reading this entire indictment to the jury. And when the jury hears this, it's pretty compelling when you hear it as a whole and don't pick out bits and pieces of it. So to me, it's, it's quite an extraordinary charge. And, and so you don't feel like it's a heavy lift to really connect the dots? No, I don't. I think from a legal standpoint, it's not that heavy. And quite frankly, I, I was uh, the first Republican to announce that I was gonna support the impeachment vote for uh, President Trump. Uh, after January 6th, and I did so because a lot of the facts are alleged in this indictment were public knowledge or knowledge to all of us in Congress at the time. And to me, I, I knew the charges that could possibly come. I knew the crimes were likely committed back then, and nothing's changed. This is simply a refutation of the president's conduct after the election where he put all his eggs in the basket of litigation. And when that failed, it was to overturn the election by electoral college votes. And both those key factors are set forth this indictment in great and concise detail. And the thing that sticks out to me, though, also about a strong charge in a conspiracy case is when you have so many co-conspirators. Now, what the question is, are they cooperating? Highly likely at least one or more is cooperating. Will they be charged? I hope so. And uh, what happens going forward with them as well? So it's going to be very interesting. But make no mistake about it, this is, an, this is a historic case and it, uh, it has a lot of meat on the bone, there's no question. I, I wanna circle back to the top of your answer because as you said, you were one of a handful of House Republicans who voted to impeach then President Trump over the events of January 6th. He now faces these charges for the efforts to overturn the 2020 election. What's your reaction to, to this moment and the significance of it? Well, uh, I have great faith in the criminal justice system. I have great faith in the people generally that prosecute cases. Uh, there has been some concerns lately about fairness. But uh, with respect to this charge in this case, I think they got it pretty right as far as what the charges should be and um, what, what, what's going to happen with this case going forward. So my, my reaction is that they, they got this pretty right. Um, the theory should have been all along a series of events from after the election up to and including January 6th. And the end result was the, the insurrection on January 6th. But that was just the end result. Uh, everything that built up to that is what this criminal conduct is alleged to have occurred. And I quite frankly think they've got it right. And if they can prove what's in this indictment, uh, that the, uh, the president has an extraordinarily difficult hill to climb to, uh, to overcome these charges. Former Congressman John Katko, we thank you so much for your time tonight. Really thank appreciate you. it. And now I want to bring in our ABC News political director, Rick Klein. Rick, you heard what Representative Katko just had to say there. Where he's thinking that this will actually sway potential Trump supporters. What's your view on, on how this will impact the primary and beyond? Well, there's no evidence of that happening yet. We have two previous indictments on much different charges, of course, Lindsay, but in, in both instances, we saw a spike in fundraising for Donald Trump, and we saw his opponents actually get a little bit weaker if Trump um, may have even gotten a little bit stronger. He has consolidated his support since then. Now, it may be that this is more serious, this is easier to understand than the previous charges around classified documents handling or around hush money to a porn star, but the bottom line is that anything that hasn't taken Trump down has made him stronger, and the, the whole framing he has of his legal and political arguments, that this is a witch hunt, that this is about trying to bring me down for political purposes, that has allowed him to, to, to use as a shield any of the information that, that, that's come in. And it's hard to imagine a lot of people really changing their minds. Of course, we got about five months before the voting starts, and that will be the question. And the president's own former vice president, Mike Pence, who of course was there that day of January 6th and ushered out of the building that day for his own safety, is now reacting. What's he saying? Yeah, uh, Lindsay, frankly, this really surprised me, and I want to read it to make sure I get it right. Today's indictment serves as an important reminder. Anyone who puts himself over the Constitution should never be president of the United States. He goes on to say, our country is more important than one man, and our Constitution is more important than any one man's career. He is making clear that he views Donald Trump as culpable for that day. Of course, those chants of hang Mike Pence still ring in his ears. He is central to the allegations in the indictment. A lot of new details that we learned today that suggest his cooperation with the special counsel. He has said all 
how long he wants to read the indictment before deciding if there are criminal charges. But as a political matter, he is making as strong a statement as he had to date to say that Donald Trump should never be president again. Yeah, I was struck by a, a, one of the pages here where it talked about a, a private conversation between the former president and Mike Pence, where allegedly the former president told him that he was too honest, which, which I just think is, is really striking. Yeah, and you, one would presume that, that that information comes from Pence himself, who we know did cooperate with the special counsel after having some objections legally. Uh, we understand that he took contemporaneous notes as well of his conversations with the with the then president. The pressure he was under was immense. Uh, it was, according to the special counsel, actually criminal. And it's key to the points that, that are being made that, that Pence himself was was central and probably the only thing that kept the the the, the coup attempt in uh, on January 6th from being a whole lot worse. Would have been if he were to allow that objection to go forward and actually do what Donald Trump demanded of him. Rick Klein, our thanks to you. And we do want to note as well that the White House tonight is referring all questions about the indictment to the Department of Justice. Now I'd like to bring in ABC News legal contributor and assistant dean at Yale Jackson School of Global Affairs, Asha Rangappa. Asha, thank you so much for joining us. People can claim that they believe they should have won something. For former President Trump, how did that lead way to criminal actions, according to this indictment at least? Yes, there's basically three main themes running here that Trump engaged in that became criminal. The first is using deception to thwart the lawful functioning of government, that he was making these false allegations of voter fraud. The second was to actually try to stop the peaceful transfer of power, obstructing an official proceeding, trying to get uh, the vice president and legislate legislators uh, and members of Congress not to certify the vote. And the last one, and this is really important, is that he was trying to prevent votes from being counted, from people's votes from being counted in a variety of states, millions of votes, um, which is a deprivation of their civil rights. And all of these uh, become criminal, even if you really think you should have won the election. And as we've been saying, the indictment does go into the allegations state by state. I want to go back to a previously released call from a conversation that Trump had in the days following the 2020 election with Brad Raffensperger, the secretary of state in Georgia, a state Biden narrowly won. Let's take a listen. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,000 780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. How much are his own words being used against him in order to make this case to suggest he knew very well what he was doing? His words are being used in, in every part of this indictment, from the conversations and pressure that he was putting on um, state legislatures and the vice president, to the tweets that he was putting out and the exhortations that he was making to the crowd in front of him. What's very extraordinary about this indictment is that it offers a very sweeping view of what led to January 6th and makes clear that the violence that unfolded that day was merely the muscle of a much bigger scheme that had gone on uh, at the state level, weaponizing the Department of Justice, a lot of these different prongs that are coming together that culminate in the violence that day. And I think the special counsel did a very masterful job of piecing all of that together for the American people. There are six unnamed co-conspirators outlined uh, throughout the indictment. I'm curious, will we ever find out who they are? Well, Lindsay, I think that will depend on whether those people, and I, I suspect they know who they are, uh, choose to cooperate with the special counsel. So right now, there might be a race to see who's going to flip first if they haven't already. Um, of course, if they don't, the statute of limitations won't expire for these crimes for another two years. And so uh, the Department of Justice still has the option to bring charges against them, but they may have chosen not to include them here in order to avoid any type of unnecessary delay that might result from adding additional defendants. Uh, this keeps it kind of streamlined. And I think also in the public perception, only naming Trump here uh, makes clear his culpability in the events that are laid out in, the, in this indictment. Asha Rangapo, so appreciate your insight. Thank you.
Today's historic indictment may be the big, the big story dominating headlines, but there's still much more to get to tonight on Prime, including an accused serial killer's appearance in court, what his wife is saying about her state of mind and why their home is now badly damaged. But next, Russia is hit by a fourth drone strike in a little more than a week, why we could be seeing a new phase in the war with Ukraine. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. The doorbell rings, and I see this teenager outside. That was the end of my life as I knew it. She shoots her in the face? What? So my dad is Joey Buttafuoco, and my mom is Mary Jo Buttafuoco. The name might ring a bell. Now, the story you thought could never get more surprising does. Most people think they know this story, but they have no clue, and it's crazy. The 2020 event, Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Columbiana, Ohio, I'm Alex Perche. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Accused Long Island serial killer Rex Huerman appeared in court today. It came as his estranged wife told ABC News that she and her children cry themselves to sleep and are now living a walking nightmare. She's also sharing photos of the destruction investigators left in their home. ABC's Ariel Reshev has more from Riverhead, New York. Tonight, the first glimpse of suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer Rex Huerman in court since the New York architect pleaded not guilty to the murders of three women. This is a 13-year case, so as you saw, uh, we have a, a, a great uh, deal of information. Prosecutors turning over more than 2,500 pages of documents and evidence to the defense. Hewerman's attorney saying his client maintains his innocence. He said from the moment I met him that I did not do this. So we're prepared to go forward. We will defend this case in a court of law. Hewerman's estranged wife, Asa Ellerup, who has filed for divorce, seen here today at the Long Island home they shared, describing how her family's life has been upended, telling ABC News, my children have been crying themselves to sleep, and I've been crying myself to sleep too. Ellerup sharing these photos of the aftermath of investigators' week-long search of their property, boxes piled up, a bathtub sliced open. Does she plan to stay in that home? Right now, that's the only place she has to reside with her and her children. She's not employed. The daughter worked for her dad, so there's been no financial income. Police say Ellerup is not a suspect and was unaware of her husband's alleged crime spree. Has she spoken to Rex since he was arrested? I believe she has, but not about the uh, not about the incident or not about the arrest. Do you know what that conversation was like? I do not know. 
Lindsay, several of the victims' families were in that hearing today, coming face to face with Hewerman for the first time. He's expected in court again next month. Lindsay? Ariel, thank you. In New York, a deadly stabbing of a 28 year old dancer at a gas station in Brooklyn is currently being investigated by the NYPD as a hate crime. In a video posted to Facebook, the deceased O'Shea Sibley can be seen alongside his friend Otis Pena. The group of friends were dancing while pumping gas and were confronted by a group of people that shouted homophobic slurs prior to Sibley being stabbed in the torso. Pena, who was at the scene, said they murdered him because he was gay, because he stood up for his friends. Twelve people were struck by a car in New York City late this afternoon. The victims, who thankfully all experienced non-life-threatening injuries, were rushed to a nearby hospital. The incident happened not too far from the iconic Chrysler building. We head now to the war between Russia and Ukraine as drones struck the heart of Moscow for the fourth time in just over a week. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel continues in Ukraine for us. Tonight, a drone slamming into the exact same skyscraper housing government offices in Moscow that was struck just three days ago. The Kremlin again accusing Ukraine for the fourth drone attack on the Russian capital in just over a week. An advisor to President Zelensky not confirming, but saying Moscow's rapidly getting used to a full-fledged war. And the Russians appear rattled, warning of a massive increase in strikes on Ukraine in retaliation. Overnight, at least five attack drones launched towards this city. Kharkiv, one hitting a dormitory for students, luckily no one there at the time. And to the south, in Kherson, this medical facility also coming under attack, an operating room destroyed. Officials say a doctor on his first day at work was killed. Lindsay, it really does appear that we're now in a new phase of this war, not just a battle on the land inside Ukraine, but also an escalating aerial conflict with drones front and centre that's now hitting right into the heart of Russia itself. Lindsay? Ian, thank you. The lieutenant governor of the state of New Jersey unexpectedly died at 71 years old just one day after being rushed to the hospital after an undisclosed medical issue. Sheila Oliver had been serving as acting governor while Governor Phil Murphy is out of state on vacation. She was the first black woman to serve as a speaker of the General Assembly and the second black woman in the country's history to lead a house of a state legislature. Governor Chris Christie went on social media to express his condolences, writing, it is a sad day for New Jersey and for me personally. The vintage Apple computer that launched the now $3 trillion company is being sold at auction this August. The Apple One computer is signed by Apple company co-founder Steve Wozniak and has been fully restored to an operational state. About 200 of them were manufactured in Steve Jobs' garage in 1976 and 1977. The computer originally sold for about $666 and it was expected to sell for about $200. $50,000 this August. So much more ahead to get to tonight. Coming up, emotional moments at the hearing for a woman accused of killing a bride on her wedding day. The decision made whether to release her on bond. But next, back to school spending is expected to reach record levels this year. We'll take a look at the cost for families by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. 
It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes, escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. Imagine if you had an institution where it was almost impossible to be held accountable. What happened with the police made me scared of them. No mother should have to bury their child. Amir Locke was killed in a botched, no-knock warrant situation. How these cops operate in this country has been America's dirty secret. Because of the color of his skin, he didn't have a chance. This is the police. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone, with the new school year just around the corner. A recent report says back-to-school spending is expected to reach record levels. Let's take a look by the numbers. Back-to-school spending is forecasted to reach a new high of $41.5 billion this year. That's up from $36.9 billion in 2022. That's according to an annual survey from the National Retail Federation and Prosper Insights. Families with children in elementary through high school say that they plan to spend about $890 per household on back-to-school items. That's up from about $25 last year. The biggest driver of costs is electronics, with 69% of shoppers expected to buy items like laptops, tablets, and calculators. Total spending on electronics for schools is expected to reach a record $15.2 billion this year, or about $326 per household with school-age children. Families are spending another $257 on clothing and accessories for back-to-school, with some 77% saying that they've noticed higher prices for clothing items with inflation still impacting shoppers. The survey also found some 55% of families said that they had already started back to school shopping as early as July with some taking advantage of deals on Amazon Prime Day and other online sales to try to get a jump start on their school supply lists. That's up from just 44% in 2019 who had started their school shopping that early. Another way to save, 13 states plan to offer a tax-free week or weekend in August where there's no state sales tax on back-to-school items, making it a little easier to afford those number two pencils, three ring binders, and 24 packs of crayons. And we still have much more ahead on Prime tonight. Accusations of a hostile work environment, sexual harassment, and weight shaming from former dancers for singer Lizzo, the claims that they're making in a new lawsuit. An amazing rescue, how a surfer ended up being pulled miles out to sea, desperate for someone to find him. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? 
and getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning, the number one newscast, number one in daytime talk, Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition, and the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you? Yes. So what will you be watching? Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, yeah. every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. ABC News, America's number one news source. A woman is charged for a murder plot targeting her husband, a lawsuit against Lizzo, and the mega billions jackpot. These stories and much more in tonight's rundown. An emotional bail hearing for the suspect in the fatal DUI crash that killed a bride and seriously injured the groom on the night of their wedding. Jamie Lee Komorowski appearing by video from jail denied bail. Her trial now set for March. She's been in custody since the April golf cart crash that took the life of Samantha Miller, who had gotten married just hours before. Komorowski charged with three counts of felony DUI resulting in great bodily injury or death and one count of reckless homicide. In court today, the judge called Kamarowski a flight risk. Kamarowski said the whole thing was a terrible accident. A Georgia woman has been charged in an alleged plot in the Bahamas to kill her estranged husband, an ex-Auburn University football player. Prosecutors in the Bahamas say 36-year-old Lindsay Shriver plotted with two men to kill Richard Shriver. The couple has filed for divorce. Suspects being held in the Bahamas, they were not required to enter a plea. The next court date is in October. Lizzo's former dancers are suing the Grammy Award-winning singer over accusations of harassment and creating a hostile work environment. Those dancers claiming sexual, religious, and racial harassment, disability discrimination, assault, and false imprisonment. The complaints allege Lizzo pressured her dancers to take part in nude photo shoots as well as attend nude performances at clubs in Amsterdam's Red Light District. Those dancers also say Lizzo made negative comments about weight gain and that her management team discriminated against black members of the dance team. Neither Lizzo or her team has responded to ABC News requests for comment. 
Retail pharmacy giant CVS is shedding 5,000 jobs. The cuts primarily affect corporate roles, scales back travel, and reduces its use of consultants. CVS says it will sharpen its focus on health care services. The cuts are not expected to impact customer service roles in stores, pharmacies, or clinics. Right now, we're right here. We pulled them out of the water out about here. So this is Fire Island Inlet. Captain Jim Hohorst and his friend Michael Ross set out for the ocean Monday morning looking for striped bass. They were checking the water for bait when they saw something moving. Indeed, police report 63-year-old Dan Ho went into the surf at 5 in the morning for a brisk swim, except the tides had their own agenda and pulled Ho miles out to sea. We're told the swimmer found ink pole in the water, tied his shirt to it, then began waving it, desperately hoping to attract someone's attention. Five hours later, Jim and Michael threw him a life ring and helped him on board. Then it was a race to raise Ho's body temperature and get him medical help. He just kept saying, I thought I was a goner. I thought I was a goner. Ready to be a billionaire? The Mega Millions jackpot skyrocketed to more than a billion dollars after no one won the top prize in Friday's drawing. In fact, no one has won the Mega Millions jackpot since April, allowing it to roll over again and again, making it the fifth largest in the game's history. Now, the chances of winning the Mega Millions jackpot is one in 302.6 million. Ah, you can do it. <laughs> The U.S. women's national soccer team is looking to win the jackpot, advancing in the World Cup, but not in the way that they were hoping to. The two-time defending champions game with Portugal ended in a draw, and the tie is enough for the Americans to advance to the round of 16. Our Maggie Rooley joins us now from Auckland, New Zealand. Maggie, you've met a lot of USA fans there. What's the morale like? <laughs> hey, Lindsay. Yeah, you know, I have to say the morale is that that game was not pretty, but it got the job done. <laughs> we caught up with so many fans after the game. And, you know, uh, when we were in that stadium, it was packed. It was a night game, but it was tense and it was stressful. Uh, we're going through to the next round. People are going to follow them to Melbourne, but the mood is sort of mixed. And I think a lot of people are were expecting more from this USA team. But, you know, Lindsay, we're out of the group stage. We're heading to the knockout rounds. And that's what so many of the players have been telling us. We chatted with a lot of them after the game last night, and they all said sort of the same thing. They acknowledge that this team does have a lot to work on. Almost all of them said they have to work on finishing off the attack. They have to turn shots on goals into actual goals. They have to gel more as a team. But they also said this is what Team USA is used to doing. They have the experience. They know how to win. They're going to win. We chatted with you know, U.S. legend and leader on the team, Megan Rapino. That's kind of the vibe she gave us. Take a listen. Ultimately, we got what we wanted out of the group, which was to get to the next stage. So we could be home, going home, and that would be really terrible. <laughs> that would actually be sad. <laughs> this is nothing to be sad about. The team is going to try to tap into that experience. You know, Megan and two other players have been there four times already to the World Cup. So they've been in tough situations before. They know how to battle back. But, Lindsay, we're now heading into the knockout stages. So one more loss and they're out, which would be unprecedented. So we're all hoping for this team to gel and to get some wins under the belt. All right. So next up, Sweden. How bad are the nerves going into that match? Likely match. It's going to be. Yeah, it's going to be a tough one, Lindsay. You know, Sweden and the U.S. are longtime rivals. They actually first met up back in 91 during the first ever World Cup. Team USA took home a victory back then. But since then, they've met up at seven of the nine World Cups. And most recently, Sweden landed U.S. with their most devastating loss in recent memory. They beat them three to nothing in the last Olympics, not only making sure that they didn't go home with a gold, but actually ending Team USA's 44-game win streak. So, Lindsay, we're going to look at a Team USA that's looking for revenge against Sweden. They're also going to use this game as an attempt to try to sort of quiet uh, this growing chorus of doubters that have emerged and to prove to the world they're still an elite team that can bring it in the knockout phase. Lindsay. I, for one, am a believer, Maggie. Let's go, Team USA. <laughs> <laughs> yes, same, same. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mag. Appreciate it. And joining us now for more on where Team USA goes from here is USA Today sports columnist and ABC News contributor Christine Brennan. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for coming on, Christine. Same here. Thanks, Lindsay.
So was that a nerve-wracking game or what? Team USA does not have to deal with what would have been the colossal disappointment, at least as Megan was saying, of going home and exiting the tournament before the knockout stage. But what was your main takeaway from this disappointing tie? Lindsay, Maggie nailed it. I mean, great reporting uh, from New Zealand, as always. And yes, this was a team that didn't even look like a team. They looked disjointed. They weren't themselves. They weren't passing the ball properly. It was as if there were 11 athletes out there playing some individual game. And it was stunning to see because we're so used to the U.S. winning, as, of course, you both just said. So, uh, the, But the, the reality is that, uh, of course, Portugal played well, and they certainly punched above their weight. And what a lovely start for them. And we know the world is getting better in large part because the United States has been leading the way, the role models for several generations now for the world uh, athletes, and they've looked to the U.S., and now they think they can beat the U.S. And so I think a lot of people are very concerned, rightly so. Where was the energy? Where was the mojo? Where was the teamwork? Where was everything that we're used to about this U.S. Women's World uh, Cup team? On the other hand, as, of course, Maggie said, they've gone through. They will be playing. They're not going home. And that by itself, of course, is the biggest plus of all. So, Christine, put us in the mindset of you in the 91st minute when you had that ball doink off of the post for Portugal. What went through your mind? Of course, getting up at 3 in the morning is not something that I do often as a sports <laughs> journalist. I think many of us don't uh, do that. But, of course, it was so important to be watching. So now it's almost, what, 5 in the morning. And, yes, it looked like that was going in. And if that had gone in... Portugal would have won the game because, to your point, it was uh, in stoppage time. There are only a few minutes left, and there just didn't seem to be any way the United States would be able to answer. So if that had occurred, it would have been the biggest upset in the history of women's soccer. And you could actually make a case, Lindsay. It might have been the biggest upset in soccer, period, certainly U.S. soccer, men's or women's. That's how big a deal it would have been. Obviously, for the U.S., great news. It hit the crossbar. Clearly, the crossbar was the most viable player of the game for the U.S. Hits the crossbar. Portugal is devastated, just absolutely emotional wrecks because they thought they had it, and uh, the U.S. is thrilled. And, you know, there's a lot of luck that's involved in sports, as you know well. As a sports fan, there's also a lot of luck in the game of soccer, and the U.S. got the big break that it needed there. Better to be lucky than good, right, Christine? <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much for coming on. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. He is a two-time Top Chef winner, just taking the crown in a global competition against other past contestants. Budalow says that his love for culture and cuisine started back in his childhood. I spoke to the Top Chef World All-Stars winner about starting his parents' restaurant, the inspirations behind his dishes, and the big step he's about to take. The chef who had our favorite dish of the day really celebrated steaming, and that chef was... Buddha. Oh, congratulations, Buddha. Right off the top, people say you're a food snob, but you say <laughs> that's not true, and there's a lot more to the backstory than that. How do you defy that label? So it depends on your definition of food snob. I, I don't think I am. Look, my wife at the at the start didn't like me because <laughs> I seem to have like a know-it-all sort of feel to me, but I mean, I'm just very passionate about what I do. And if I know something, I'll say it. It's my field. I'm passionate about cooking, and I've loved cooking for such a long time. So if I really um, come off like a kind of like a know-it-all, it's because I really want to engage in a conversation of, about food because I'm really passionate about it. What do you credit with your success as far as, you know, it's not just that you won Top Chef among the basic Top Chefs, but you won Top Chefs among the world's best Top Chefs. As an executive chef nowadays, I've spent most of my career actually just working for people. And those people were pushing me and teaching me. And that's why when I came to Top Chef, it found another avenue to bring out this sort of out of comfort zone experience where I was constantly pushing myself and learning more dishes and more about myself and the cooking that I can do. I think you were 12 when you started working in your parents' kitchen, right, in the restaurant. Was it just a job at that point, or did you realize already you had a love affair with food? I was in love from the moment that I started doing it. I started off as a server, actually, at nine years old, because 
you know, as I think most children growing up in a Chinese restaurant, they find out that their parents are working more in the restaurant and you don't get that time. So I was like, hey, I don't want to stay at home on the weekends. I want to go do something. And I was running like little plates of food maybe three or four times a night and then watching cartoons in the back. <laughs> but then all of a sudden, I just really loved the reaction of someone going wow and mm. enjoying the meal. and and. I was like, I really love that feeling, and then I just wanted to be in a career where I can constantly do that. And I think with my food, I don't just only cook just to feed people, but just to make sure that they have an experience and make sure that they feel that sort of wow that I got when I was nine years old. And, and talk to us about uh, the culture that's in your cuisine. Grew up in Australia, worked in your parents' uh, Chinese restaurant, lived all over the world. I feel like. I don't really constrict myself to a certain cuisine. I find so much interest in the world and, you know, I love going to travel to Thailand, Italy, France and learn about their culture and food because I feel like there's so much that you can learn about the history when you eat a dish, uh, when you sit down with someone and learn how to cook it. That is years and generations of culture and I really, really love being a part of that. Top Chef, people keep coming back season after season. What do you think it is that keeps people so interested? First of all, it's not done in a studio. So it is going from place to place and you're exploring the culture and you're learning a lot through the cooking. And I think that's what's so beautiful about Top Chef and why people keep watching it. Buddha. Technically, the fish was cooked beautifully. There was a lot of variety, both in flavor and in texture. Thank you. It's been announced that after 19 seasons, Padma's not coming back. Your reaction to that? I found out just as soon as everyone else did uh, on social media. I was sitting next to my wife um, and my jaw dropped for probably about two minutes and she kind of <laughs> went, what's happening? <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was, a, it was a shock and at that point I already knew that I have won. And so having that knowledge of the announcements coming in a couple of weeks and knowing that it's the last time Padma's going to crown someone top chef, it felt like, you know, that win was just so much more. And her replacement chef, you have a lot of respect for. Oh, Kristen Kish, I absolutely love. I think that she's going to do amazing. Having a Top Chef uh, winner into the judges' seat really is going to highlight different aspects of not only just what's on the plate, but what the chef was trying to do or portray. And, and talk to us about something that you love that you think that people might be surprised. Um, I'm a big fan of Popeye's chicken. Um, I, <laughs> they're probably going to give me a brand endorsement <laughs> now. But, um, but when I do want to jazz it up, I do put a bit of caviar in it as well. Oh, and that's, wow. that, is, that is my ultimate guilty pleasure. Um, I have that with most celebratory occasions. Uh, I don't have it every day, but when I do have it, I actually remember every single moment that I've had it, just because the combination is just so good. Never would have guessed. Popeyes, are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> If you were trying to impress someone or when you and Rebecca were dating, do you remember that particular entree that you prepare <laughs> that you're like, oh, I'm going to get them? <laughs> uh, one of my favorite things to cook is a Wellington. Uh, it's, oh I just think that there's so many levels of how you can cook it into the perfection of the crust to the patterns to, you know, you've got so many levels of it. And I think that I continue to push myself to try and understand the science between it. That is textbook. The fact that the fish is levitating in the middle of that, it is stunning. It's like a picture. It's a piece of art. Speaking of the oven, uh, your wife, who's a pastry chef, has yeah. two buns in the oven, yeah. right? Uh, uh, your reaction to, to that news? Oh, it was crazy. So first of all, my wife's a pastry sous chef at 11 Madison Park. And when we found out that we, she was pregnant, we looked at the ultrasound and we're like, OK, there's, there's a baby, like, congratulations, and then Boom, another one came out into, <laughs> into, the, into the ultrasound and I almost fell off my chair. <laughs> she couldn't fall off hers. But uh, it was crazy just to see that. Um, we're very, very lucky. What's next for you? Can't wait for the twins to come out and be a father and obviously open up some restaurants and just continue doing what I love. The entire series of Top Chef, including its Top Chef World All-Star season, is available to stream on Peacock. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us.
This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We are honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. Reporting from Denver, I'm Mola Lenghi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin with yet another striking moment in American history. Former President Donald Trump has been indicted again, this time in a push to overturn the 2020 election. He now faces three criminal indictments. At the same moment, he's also the clear front runner in the Republican race to win back the White House in 2024. Special Counsel Jack Smith addressed the country late today, encouraging Americans to read the 45-page, four-count criminal indictment, which begins by saying the former president lost the 2020 election, knew he lost it, and then for months spread lies that there had been outcome determinative fraud in the election and that he had actually won. Smith stressed, though, the defendant must be presumed innocent until proven guilty. The sprawling indictment accuses Trump of three conspiracies, one to defraud the U.S., a second to obstruct an official government proceeding, and a third to deprive people of civil rights provided by federal law or the Constitution. The fourth count is obstruction of and attempt to obstruct an official proceeding. We're told today prior to the news of the indictment, the former president was golfing at his home in Bedminster. But how's he reacting tonight? Our John Santucci just spoke to him on the phone. He'll join us shortly. Our team is standing by tonight to break down this entire indictment for us and what comes next. We begin with Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Tonight, Donald Trump, former president of the United States, indicted for allegedly trying to subvert democracy and overturn the will of American voters in the 2020 election because he was determined to remain in power. Today, an indictment was unsealed, charging Donald J. Trump with conspiring to defraud the United States, conspiring to disenfranchise voters, and conspiring and attempting to obstruct an official proceeding. Trump informed of the sweeping indictment just before it was unsealed. The charges outlined in the sweeping indictment. Prosecutors say Trump spread lies that there had been outcome determinative fraud in the election and that he had actually won. These claims were false and the defendant knew they were false. Still, they say Trump worked to create an intense national atmosphere of mistrust and anger and erode public faith in the administration of the election. The indictment going methodically, state by state, accusing Trump and his unnamed co-conspirators of creating fraudulent slates of electors in seven states, of trying to compel the Justice Department to sham election crime investigations, of pressuring Vice President Mike Pence to reject legitimate electoral votes on January 6th, and ultimately sending his supporters to the Capitol to obstruct the certification proceeding and exert pressure on the Vice President. We're going to walk down to the Capitol... And we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. 
Smith's indictment documenting dozens of Trump's alleged lies and the pressure he put on Republican state officials. In a phone call, Trump pushing Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger to find the votes he needed. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have. Because we won the state. Prosecutors allege Trump's criminal scheme culminated on January 6th with what they call the president's exploitation of the violence and chaos at the Capitol. Our Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, just big picture this for us. How serious are these charges being brought by the special counsel? This is perhaps the biggest case in the history of the Justice Department. They've essentially indicted a former sitting president, accusing him of being criminal in office, that he essentially knew he lost the election, that there was no wide-scale fraud, and that he then attempted to steal the election for himself. So you feel a lot more gravity here than the two prior indictments? Well, those were quite serious in terms of taking classified documents away from the White House, making them vulnerable, uh, this obstruction case into a building in terms of a cover-up. But this gets at the heart of American democracy. What does a president do if they lose? Mm. And the Justice Department is saying he knew he lost and then attempted to steal the election. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you as always. Pleasure. I want to bring in our friend John Santucci, who joins us now. John, of course, you've covered the Trump campaign from the very beginning with that escalator ride at Trump Tower to where we are tonight. You mm. spoke with the former president just a little while ago. Describe his mood for us. Uh, Lindsay, it was a very calm, subdued Donald Trump when he spoke to me uh, just moments after the news of that indictment broke. Uh, and I talked to him about it and saying, you know, what is your reaction to yet another charge? He called this pile on the charges by special counsel Jack Smith joining the already charges by special counsel Jack Smith regarding the documents probe and also the Manhattan DA's case. Uh, he said that yet again he believed the prosecutors were trying to, quote, interfere in an election, obviously an election, Lindsay, as we both know, that he is a candidate for 2024. Uh, and he called all the charges when I said, you know, when you look at the total field of all this, what's the word that comes to your mind? He said, ridiculous. But nevertheless, Donald Trump tells me tonight, Lindsay, that he maintains that he is going to fight and he believes he is going to win not only these cases, but also another term in the White House. And you're, of course, very plugged into Trump's orbit. What are they telling you tonight about this latest indictment? You know, the word I heard, Lindsay, repeatedly uh, as we were reading through the indictment in real time, avoidable bad. Uh, another person writing me, I wish he listened to the good people, the good lawyers. And a lot of what we learned in tonight's new indictment is that it was those other lawyers that were providing him with that advice about fake electors, ways to overturn the election. Donald Trump listened to those people, and obviously that has resulted in tonight's latest indictment, Lindsay. John Santucci, pleasure to have you on as always. Thanks, Lindsay. Let's bring in our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. John, we've gotten a chance to go through this 45-page indictment. What, what strikes you? What stands out? The, the weight of it, the seriousness of it. We, we know Donald Trump is facing legal challenges everywhere. There's the New York Attorney General's, the, 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 the district attorney's case. There's the civil case from the New York Attorney General. Uh, there's the Georgia case, which we expect. There's the documents case. This, I think is qualitatively different than all of them and weightier. He is being charged here with deprivation of rights. That's one of the counts. What does that mean? It means depriving American citizens of what right? Their right to have their vote count. Uh, you see chapter and verse how he tried to overturn an election that he knew he had lost. And not by challenging it in court the way losing candidates often do and have a right to do, but by uh, going through a series of actions that Jack Smith alleges are plainly illegal. And we also heard from John Santucci, who got a chance to speak yeah. to the former president today. And, you know, he was saying that this is a pylon, calling it ridiculous. Is it that easy just to kind of blow this off? I mean, absolutely not. You know, I, first of all, this, if you, I want to take you back to a moment, a really important moment. It was February 13th of 2021. Donald Trump had just been acquitted by the uh, U.S. Senate in the impeachment trial. Uh, now, seven Republicans had voted to found him guilty, which was, you know, a high watermark in all of American history uh, for a, a party, a president's party. Uh, but right after it, Mitch McConnell rose to speak. He had voted uh, not guilty. 
but he wanted to make it clear he didn't mean not guilty in a literal sense. And he said we, it was his view that he shouldn't be impeached because he was already out of office, uh, but that the legal system, the criminal justice system, can and will hold him to account. That's finally happening two and a half years later. All right, many people didn't think that this day would come, yeah. and we'll see what ultimately comes out of it. But John, we thank you so much for your coverage. Thank you. We're joined now by ABC News contributor and former Republican Congressman John Katko, who was one of 10 House Republicans who voted to impeach then-President Trump over the events of January 6th. Thanks so much for coming back on the show. As a former president now faces these charges for efforts to overturn the election, just give us your reaction to this particular moment and its significance. I'm wondering if you feel in any way vindicated. Well, uh, this is not unexpected. and. What I think is really interesting is the facts and circumstances set out in the indictment are really, much of it was known to the public in some way, shape, or form, at least anecdotally, way back when this all was unfolding uh, after January, on about January 6th. So that is, those facts are what formed a basis for votes like mine, for Republicans to stand up and do the right, but I believe was the right thing to do under the circumstances. And what this indictment is, it's very simple in that it's a conspiracy. Conspiracy is two or more persons joined together for a criminal uh, idea. And this is to overturn the election results. And that the president was part of it. That's the, that's the standard of proof. Everything else in this indictment is a factual recitation of Trump's involvement. And it's also gutting a lot of his possible defenses because he's saying, I really believe this, I was being told this. There's chapter and verse, as one of my colleagues just noted, of instances where he is being told it's not true, and he still plows on. So to me, this is a very potent indictment, and it's a very simple indictment in some respects, and it's extraordinary given the fact that it's a former president of the United States of America. You were in Congress when this effort to bring fake electors to Washington took place. What strikes you the most from these charges as far as what's outlined with Trump's involvement in that effort? Well, to me, what strikes me most is that it, it, they're probably well-placed and well-deserved. I have no animus. I thought the president in 2016 was a very different person than he was in 2020. And uh, a lot changed. And not accepting election results is simply un-American. And the facts are there. Uh, the charges are there. And um, he's going to have a tough time, in my opinion, based on my 20 years of prosecuting cases like these uh, as a federal prosecutor before Congress, he's going to have a tough time convincing 12 people in a jury box that uh, he didn't, he wasn't part of this conspiracy. Prior to this indictment, a new poll from the New York Times and Siena College showed Trump's continuing political power. Just you can see it on your screen there. He leads the GOP 2024 field with 54 percent support. His next closest challenger, Ron DeSantis, is at 17 percent. The rest of the field all at 3 percent or lower. Can you see primary voters standing by him still in the months ahead as they head to the polls? Uh, highly likely that his core will, but his core is going to be uh, continually smaller. And I'll remind you that in 2015, I believe there's a certain Donald Trump who was in the single digits at this time in the election cycle. So you don't know. There's a lot of road uh, between now and, and, and when people start actually casting their votes. And what they're thinking now generally as, to, as opposed to what they're thinking when it comes time to cast your vote could be two different things. And a lot can change between now and then. But make no mistake about it. Uh, the former president has a commanding lead. But that lead, in my opinion, and I think politically, political history will back me up, is not insurmountable. And so really quickly, in the last seconds we have before we have to let you go, do you think that it's very possible that he may not be the nominee? I'm not saying it's not possible. It wouldn't shock me. There's a lot of great candidates out there that are uh, starting to get some traction. And as more and more people take a look at this indictment and read it, I think that they might start uh, changing their mind. And once that happens, it could have a cascading effect. Former Congressman. So stay tuned. We, we certainly will be doing that. Former Congressman John Katko, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. So much more to get to tonight coming up as the man accused of being serial killer appears in court. His wife is revealing details about her life since the arrest and the state of their home. The next new details on the case against internet personality Andrew Tate, the decision he's trying to appeal in a Romanian court. Whenever news breaks, 
to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas, ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Imagine if you had an institution where it was almost impossible to be held accountable. What happened with the police made me scared of them. No mother should have to bury their child. Amir Locke was killed in a botched no-knock warrant situation. How these cops operate in this country has been America's dirty secret. Because of the color of his skin, he didn't have a chance. That's the sound of the police. Reporting from Chicago, I'm Alex Perez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Internet personality Andrew Tate and his brother Tristan left a Romanian court after a hearing on their appeal against their house arrest. The Tate brothers, along with two Romanian female suspects, are under house arrest pending a criminal investigation for abuses committed against seven women. No ruling was issued, and the brothers, who have denied all accusations, will remain under house arrest until then. Four Nigerians hoping to reach Europe as they hit above the rudder of a cargo ship were stunned when they actually arrived in Brazil. They spent 10 days at sea and to prevent themselves from falling into the water, they rigged up a net around the rudder and tied themselves to with it a rope. Two of the men asked to be returned to Nigeria while the other two are hoping to be granted asylum in the South American nation. A wedding took place in a flooded church after a typhoon hit the Philippines eyewitness video. You see it right there. Shows the bride walking down a flooded aisle in a wedding gown as the guests cheered. Where there is a will, there is a way. She was determined she was getting married there. Accused Long Island serial killer Rex Hureman appeared in court today. It came as his estranged wife told ABC News that she and her children cry themselves to sleep and are now living a walking nightmare. She's also sharing photos of the destruction investigators left in their home. ABC's Ariel Reshef has more from Riverhead, New York. Tonight, the first glimpse of suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer Rex Hewerman in court since the New York architect pleaded not guilty to the murders of three women. This is a 13-year case, so as you saw, uh, we have a, a great uh, deal of information. Prosecutors turning over more than 2,500 pages of documents and evidence to the defense. Hewerman's attorney saying his client maintains his innocence. He said from the moment I met him that I did not do this. So we're prepared to go forward. We will defend this case in a court of law. Hewerman's estranged wife, Asa Ellerup, who has filed for divorce, seen here today at the Long Island home they shared, describing how her family's life has been upended, telling ABC News, my children have been crying themselves to sleep, and I've been crying myself to sleep too. Ellerup sharing these photos of the aftermath of investigators' week-long search of their property, boxes piled up, a bathtub sliced open. Does she plan to stay in that home? Right now, that's the only place she has to reside with her and her children. She's not employed. The daughter worked for her dad, so there's been no financial income. Police say Ellerup is not a suspect and was unaware of her husband's alleged crime spree. Has she spoken to Rex since he was arrested? I believe she has, but not about the, uh, not about the incident or not about the arrest. Do you know what that conversation was like? I do not know. 
Our thanks to Ariel for that. Now we head to the war between Russia and Ukraine as drones struck the heart of Moscow for the fourth time in just over a week. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel continues in Ukraine for us. Tonight, a drone slamming into the exact same skyscraper housing government offices in Moscow that was struck just three days ago. The Kremlin again accusing Ukraine for the fourth drone attack on the Russian capital in just over a week. An advisor to President Zelensky not confirming, but saying Moscow's rapidly getting used to a full-fledged war. And the Russians appear rattled, warning of a massive increase in strikes on Ukraine in retaliation. Overnight, at least five attack drones launched towards this city, Kharkiv, one hitting a dormitory for students, luckily no one there at the time. And to the south, in Kherson, this medical facility also coming under attack. An operating room destroyed. Officials say a doctor on his first day at work was killed. Our thanks to Ian for that. There is word that North Korea has responded to UN outreach about the U.S. soldier who crossed the border on his own two weeks ago. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz joins us now. Martha, what are you learning about that contact? Lindsay, the contact was through the U.N. command, not the U.S. directly. The North Koreans acknowledging finally they have Travis King and saying they are investigating the matter. Of course, what makes this case so unusual and so complicated is that Travis King bolted across that border on his own, on purpose, after leaving the airport in Seoul, where he was supposed to head back to the U.S. to face discharge from the U.S. Army. I'm told he has already been interrogated by the North Koreans, but given this is the first time the North Koreans have responded to the UN. This may be a sign that North Korea is willing to negotiate his release, although nothing moves quickly in negotiations with the North Koreans, Lindsay. But perhaps some reason to be optimistic there. Martha, our thanks to you. And still to come, rallying his supporters to fight for freedom, musician turned activist Bobby Wine tells us about the new documentary chronicling his dangerous journey to run against Uganda's current president. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The doorbell rings, and I see this teenager outside. That was the end of my life as I knew it. She shoots her in the face? What? So my dad is Joey Buttafuoco, and my mom is Mary Jo Buttafuoco. The name might ring a bell. Now, the story you thought could never get more surprising does. Most people think they know this story, but they have no clue, and it's crazy. The 2020 event, Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. Bobby Wine is a musician turned activist, rallying his supporters to fight for freedom from Ugandan President Museveni's 35 year regime. His dangerous journey is told in National Geographic's film Bobby Wine, the People's President. ABC News' Ariel Reshef sat down with the presidential candidate and his wife. <laughs> We are nonviolent and we continue to preach nonviolence. I am not a criminal. I am a presidential candidate. Nothing will stop him. We must get our freedom or we shall die trying. The documentary takes us behind the scenes of your presidential campaign in 2021. You faced threats against your life. Some members of your team were killed. The director of the film was shot in the face and nearly died. How dangerous has this journey been for you? It's been very dangerous, but it can only 
get more dangerous. I mean, the only thing that is more dangerous than the way it is is keeping quiet about it. You were arrested, thrown in jail, charged with treason. What was that period of your life like? Man, it was crazy. It was crazy. I was, for example, in Arua, I was arrested in a hotel room. I was beaten so bad with iron bars, dragged, put into a place that was uh, poured with water, beaten so much, electricity was put on me. I had my genitals squeezed, I was beaten. My wife was able to see me. She was one of the very few Ugandans that came together with the U European Union ambassadors. She could not recognize me. What did you think when you first watched the documentary? Only a small fraction of the violence was shown. So I felt like the documentary does not do justice to the detail of the oppression back home, of the violence, of the medieval torture. There's only a certain level of violence that can be shown. Violence was too extreme to be depicted. Barbie, you married a pop star who became a politician. Did you ever have any trepidations about Bobby's political career? I never thought Bobby would go into politics. But along the way, I saw signals. He began to get concerned about the things that he never got concerned about. What he's doing is more dangerous than it was in the beginning. The level of fear is more than I ever have ever had. So it really scares me. President Museveni has been in office since 1986. This film captures your struggle against a government that has had a stronghold on power for decades. Yeah. How difficult is your journey ahead? The journey ahead is difficult. And what makes it even more difficult is the fact that the regime back home is enforced by superpowers and the world's greatest democracies, including the United States of America. If General Museveni was just alone using Ugandan taxpayers' money to oppress us, we would fight and win the battle even much more easily. But we cannot fight against one billion US dollars every year that is being given to Uganda. There are a lot of Americans who are struggling to put food on the table. They're busy, worried about what's going on here at home. Why should they watch this film and why should they care about your story? They should care about our story because it is not only our story, it is their story too, whether they know or they don't know. They are paying for our oppression through their taxpayers' money and they can stop it. They can petition, they, are, they can reach out to their leaders and ask them to change policies. General Museveni ordered the military to take charge and unleashed untold violence. I was put under house arrest. He, using the army, once again declared himself president. I am out on bail, battling a treason charge which carries the death sentence. I have numerous charges that have been put on, on me after so much international criticism. Some of those cases are put on the halt, but they are always picked up, you know, whenever they need to prosecute me. What's your message to Museveni? Um, General Museveni, my message to him is, we are not going to give up the fight for our rights. We don't preach violence, we don't preach hate. We shall get our freedom or we shall die trying to get our freedom. Really powerful interview there. Thanks to Ariel. You can watch Bobby Wine, the People's President, which is now in theaters. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. Have a great night.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of the 